Father, this morning we come with grateful hearts. Church, let's lift our hands. Let's just give Him a big shout of praise. We love You, Lord. We come excited, Father, that, Lord, You are still on the throne. Lord, that You are the God, the great I Am, the beginning, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Lord, we are grateful this morning that we can gather. We're many can't, but we can gather. We can worship corporately together. Lord, Love the words of the songs that, Lord, no matter what the enemy brings, you turn all things around for good to those who are called by you and love you. And so this morning we open our hearts. Don't even like this fact that we have to move on so quickly, but we have another service, but Lord, we are just so open. You can you look not only will speak, but something will start today. I just pray, Lord, that see right now, my spirit, I just sense seeds dropping in, seeds of expectation, of hope, even of transformation as people are going, I'm not going to be who I was before. These, cha- these times have caused me to become something different, something new, something more in love with Jesus, somebody more in love with Jesus. So Lord, as seeds are planted through worship and through the Word, that they will continue to grow as we lead, as we uh, go out of the place later on, as we mingle. But Lord, I pray right now as we move into Your Word that You will speak louder than I can speak, You will speak clearer than I can speak, and You will drop greater seeds than what I can do. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Great to have everybody back. Well, not everybody. We've got another service. So grab your seats. We can't even tell you to go mingling and um, because we just can't do that. Though we want to do that and I'm not going to look if you do do that. I'm not going to stop it. And um, so, uh, do you know, uh, I got emotional you know, walking around saying some of you. It was nothing to do with your appearance. It was to, all to do with the fact that uh, I missed some of you. Oh, actually, I missed all of you. I didn't think I would. But uh, <laughs> no, I thought I was independent. You know, you're a male, you don't need anybody. Anybody else felt like that? Or was it just me? I was three that are telling the truth this morning. And uh, then you discover we were created. We were created not to be alone, not to be isolated. And so it's good to have everybody back. Yeah. I will, if I keep talking like this, I'm going to start crying. So, all right, well, we're back and we've returned. And even though it's a different feel and, and we're, we're trying multiples and we'll see how we go in, uh, in this season, it still feels good to worship again. And, um, and thank you for the band and everybody for getting up. And some, we had to have last minute changes, some had colds and stuff like that, so they have to stay back. And so we've had some changes at the last minute. But a big warm welcome to Luke and Caitlin. Yeah. They got married at the end of March and their plans in New Zealand got waylaid because of everything. But what a time to have a shutdown on your honeymoon. Baby, bring it on. Hey. So they didn't see the world uh, for weeks. So great way to start a marriage. (laughs) You will have stories to tell you in the next nine months. No, no, no. So uh, (laughs) you see, I've just not been connecting with people enough to to know my filters. Um, uh, Seamus, I have a good Irish joke for you later on, okay? You're going to love this one. All right. I'm being banned from saying it in church. And, uh, and look, at the end of the service, we've got to leave that through that door there, go out through there, and there's a coffee van at, outside that Leonie, who's part of our church, that's her van, her business. She's running that. We've asked her to run it so that you can be provided uh, as we've got some renos going in there and we just can't hang out in the building too much. And so... And thanks to all those who have continued to just care for you, one another. You have been awesome in care, reaching out to each other. Just, uh, it's really been a body ministry and we just appreciated it. And, um, and those who have continued to tithe and give, those who have been working on the building, we've got a new screen up there and all things that have been taking place behind the scenes. And uh, thank you for that. And we even start the breakfast club this week. So on Thursday, we're back there. We've got more opportunities there in the high school. So it's all coming back. And so we are really, really excited about that. But our services are shorter. So we need to get into the Word. I can't waffle too much. I'm not even sure. That, don't look at me like that, <laughs> Carl. You're going, you not waffle? That's a miracle. We're, yes, it's true. And, uh, but you know what? In, my, in this breakdown, um, breakdown, shutdown, whatever we call it, 
I, my daughter celebrated 30th. My brother-in-law today is stuck in London and he celebrates his 50th. And last night I got to celebrate uh, my mum's secret number. So somewhere between, it's a magic number with a zero on the end, between 70 and 90. So I worked that one out. <laughs> and um, I didn't tell you what it was, but uh, we had a great time. And um, anyone else who had birthdays, weddings, babies, awesome. Congratulations. If you fell pregnant, we know why. And uh, we're expecting influx of babies in the next nine months. So, Okay, I've waffled enough. Let's get into the Word. Check the online teaching I've been doing in this last week about it's the... Um, about the living with the end in mind and go into all of that. You'll see some comments already about my interpretations and deductions, and, uh, but it's all good. I enjoy it. But I want to uh, continue on today, really be, and be thematic about what is happening in our world at the moment. Jesus in Matthew 10 said at one stage in that script passage, he said, the brother would rise against brother and children rebel against their fathers and their mothers. And, and though this has been happening since Cain and Abel, uh, we really see it's happening in our world in another level today. And we know it's always happened, but right now it is a particular fa- focus uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement and protests that are going on, and rightfully so. However, today I'm not giving you a political sermon, but a person sermon, a people sermon. I'm not here to make a political statement because the cause of the deaths of black people is not white people or any other colour. It's racism and fear that comes from sin that is in every man. So that's what we want to go back to and deal with some of that stuff that causes us. See, God in the beginning made everyone equal, just like the Godhead is equal, but different. He said, I make you, I'm making you in my image. So he made God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit, the three but one. They make, we have a spirit that is in his image. So colour of skin, financial standing, culture, nationality, intelligence, age, looks, baldness, ability or disability, gender or anything else do not make anyone more valued or loved by God. Everybody is extremely equal. And so before God, every life matters. The black life, the cop's life, the white lives, the Indian lives, the Kenyan lives, the old lives, the unborn lives, all matter to God and therefore they matter to us. Racism, murder, violence and inequality are not specific to black and white lives. I've been to Dachau concentration camp where Jews and gypsies and others were interned and killed. I've been to Cambodia and the multiple killing fields with fields of bones still there. I've been to Toussalong Torture Museum, which was once a school that used kids to, to torture uh, people during Pol Pot's range, reign, all because they were intelligent, all looked different. Mao Zedong and Stalin killed more people than Hitler. In China, Christians and minority ethnic groups are persecuted, imprisoned and even killed today. In Africa, there's black against black and white against black. There's tribal and political genocides that have taken place. And we can never, ever forget what the, uh, the apartheid in South Africa. We have unborn babies of all colour being killed all around the world. And recently, the New Zealand Prime Minister slipped in uh, during the COVID crisis, uh, ex- the most extreme abortion laws the world has ever seen. So we have a bigger issue. Go- we're not, not, not belittling any other issues that's going on right now, we have a, but we have a, a major issue going on that goes beyond Black Lives Matter without belittling the Black Lives Matter. All lives matter. We need to look at causes rather than symptoms and we can't go back to change the injustices of the past, but we can move forward. The only way to do that is to look at the one who created all of us equal. What model did he set? What does his word say? I came across a couple of quotes this week and you might find them unusual, but Tiny Tim. You remember Tiny Tim, the entertainer? He wasn't that tiny, I understand. Uh, he had this high, shrill voice and sung tiptoe through the tulips. It was a one-hit wonder. He said, I'd love to see Christ come back to crush the spirit of hate and make men put down their guns. I'd also like one more hit single. Christ, but you know what, Tiny? You've passed away and you've discovered this already, but Christ is coming back. But he's also left his presence on this earth, the church, to be a force of love and reconciliation. That's what our mission is, to reveal the mission and the heart of God. Marvin Gaye wrote during the 60s, um, late 60s, early 70s, he wrote that a song called Father. And it says, don't go and talk about my father. I'm not even going to sing it. 
I've already had so many comments about my singing during the online productions. <clears throat> you all love it, it pay, but no one paid me for it. Um, but he said, don't go and talk about my father. God is my friend. Jesus is my friend. He is my friend. He made this world for us to live in. He made this world. He gave us everything. Lord gave us everything. And all he asks of us peace is we give each other love. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Love your mother, love, she bore you. Love your father, he works for you. Love your sister, she's good to you. Love your brother, love your brother. Unfortunately, his dad killed him. We have too many broken families and torn apart nations. Another symptom of sin in this world. Church, we are called to be ministers of love and reconciliation. Others may want justification, but God's people want reconciliation. So how do we followers of Jesus respond? How should we respond? Some may join protests in the streets or online, but there's something everybody, there's something permanent everybody that is a follower of Jesus can do. And in Matthew 22, we read this, verse 35 to 40. Then one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, saying, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God of all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments, all the law and the prophets hang. This is the starting point of everything else that is to follow. So firstly, what do we do? We've got to love God first. If we don't love God, we can never truly love anybody else because it's, He is pure love and we learn and we receive love through Him. We can't love until we've been loved and forgiven ourselves. It's the church, not religion, that will show the world how to love and reveal Jesus. We will not be stopped. Jesus on the cross cried out, Father, forgive us, forgive them, even while, even while we were hating Him. He was crying out, Father, forgive them. That's the power, see, the power of choosing to love. Not feeling to love, but choosing to love. We're not talking about emotion, but a choice. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 to 7. He said a number of times, he goes, love is, not love feels, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love is a choice that we make to live a certain way. Love is. David Wilkinson, who strongly spoke up against sin in the world and the church, and at times he seemed to be quite hard, but he was mainly hard against the church, trying to get stir them up. And, and uh, he prophesied, he was one of the few that prophesied many years ago the devastation of, in New York and USA that they're experiencing now. And he's famous for a book, uh, for a, a ministry that he did in the uh, ghettos and the gangs of New York, back in the late 50s or 60s, I think it was. And he wrote the book, The Cross and the Switchblade. And in that period, at one time, he's confronting these gangs and they were bloodthirsty. One of them was called the Mau Mau, named after the Kenyan, uh, no, sorry, the uh, Congo gangs that were around in those days and they were known for their bloodthirstiness. And so he, at one time, he's confronted as he's trying to reach. He's just a skinny little pastor, he described, from the country that God said, go and love these people. So he went in without any preparation into these gangs. If you've never read the book, you need to read the book. It's, one, it's almost like one of those fundamental books that uh, you need to read. And so he tells the story in The Cross and the Switchblade. And at one stage, he's threatened. Uh, we've been cut into one family. He says, I'm gonna, the, the young guy says, I'll cut you into thousands of pieces. And he spoke back and he said to him, Nicky, to the gang leader, Nicky Cruz, Every, if you do, and every one of those pieces will cry out, God loves you and I love you. That power of love converted Nicky Cruz. Nicky Cruz ran, wrote a book called Run, Baby Run, and a few others. I think from memory, I'm, the, the, the book names might be different, but he then wrote, became an, an, a well-known evangelist, saving many thousands. Others got saved out of that. And then the Teen Challenge ministry that is worldwide started from that moment. The church, Times Square, the Times Square Church in New York, a great church of outreach and prophetic in New York is also the other result 
because of that man's obedience and the de desire to love. We will not change anything until we see how much God loves people. We won't see that until we know personally how much he loves. Because without him, we see a cause or a protest. But with him, it's about him and his creation. Love God so we can purely, not have an emotion, not have a reaction, but purely love others. 1 John 4, 7 to 8. And this has really challenged me as I've done my research and this scripture has jumped out. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. In other words, everyone from 1 Corinthians 13 who loves like that has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. I think there's going to be a few wake-up calls when we discover that. You may ask, so where is this God of love? Look at the world. Where is he? He's waiting for us to come back to him through Jesus. See, he didn't make the world this way. Sin in us from following Satan made the world this way. The Father has left us because he gave us a will, left us to our own will. And this is what we have created following Satan. However, he's also made a way through Jesus so that we, through our own will, can choose to follow our Father through Jesus Christ using our will to choose Him. The second thing I want to highlight very quickly is that we don't react, we need to respond. This is a really practical thing. Something I learned many years ago because I am a reactionist. I can explode, I can do all kinds of things, but in a season of my life, God, this was this, the one particular year, I think it was around 2012, it was that don't react, respond, don't react, respond. Be wise, stop looking at the politics and see the people. See, on the cross, two thieves hung on either side of Jesus. As he's hanging there, one reacted to his situation and, do, and, and against God and died, missing out on the Jesus that was next to him. The other responded to the goodness and mercy of Jesus and went to heaven. Black, white, yellow, husband, wife, brother, sister, don't react, respond, be wise. Think before we speak and act. We can speak up on lots of stuff, but at the end, it's what God thinks about people that matter. Remove what ifs, the buts, the prejudices of what we didn't do and what has been done and think through the heart of Jesus. Both, both thieves deserved their sentence, but Jesus reached out to both of them. One reacted and got nothing or hell. The other responded and received Jesus. Years ago, I was confronted uh, in our society, and we still are confronted with our society, about saying sorry for the past injustices that have been done upon our Indigenous uh, uh, brothers and sisters. And uh, I would argue I didn't do the injustices against the Aboriginal people. I, could argue, I would argue that two of my cousins, my real cousins, are Indigenous. My sister-in-law is South Africa, who went through apartheid. My nephew is Chinese. My daughter-in-law is Fijian. My little grandson, I had time, I'll show you some videos of him right now. He's half Fijian. And so I'm not racist. That's what I would argue. I didn't do it, so I don't have to say sorry. And one day I was on a missions trip to Sri Lanka. It was not a good trip. Everything that was meant to happen went wrong. And, um, but out of it, God changed my heart here. Out of it, one of the largest churches in this nation, the pastor was with me on his first mission trip. And now he has the la second largest church in the nation. And uh, it's, I'm saying it started there because it was a disaster of a trip. But in that, the Holy spoke, Spirit spoke to me. Why can't you say sorry? Why can't you feel regret and sorrow for how our nation has treated its people? What will it do if you or the people of Australia did say sorry? So this is back in the 90s. If, it's not about me, it's about us. These are the promptings of the Holy Spirit. It's not about race, but about relationship. So instead of reacting with my self-centered arguments, I responded. And I spoke on it. I even spoke it while I was traveling. And that has become now part of my response in marriage. Because I'm talking beyond colour. I'm, I'm talking about relationships. Not to react, but to respond. Why, why can't I say sorry? With my family, my church, and all relations. And so with that, it takes me to the, second, to, to the main point I want to talk about this morning. 
that we're called to be ministers of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says this, in verse 15, And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves. Hear that. That when we follow him, we no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Wow. We don't regard people from a worldly point of view, but a heavenly. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself, who through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Man, break that down in your life groups as we just unpack. What does that mean to us? He didn't count my sin against me. Still doesn't because Jesus has washed it. So what an attitude to live with. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ ambassadors. What I said earlier, Jesus has sent us. We are Christ ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. God wants us to represent all of his, all of his love to the world. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And God made him who had, had no sin be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Powerful, powerful reminder of what and who has happened to us and what we have become and what our mission is. We have been given a ministry of reconciliation. I know the main point is about reconciling man to God. But if you've got God living in you, then you are a reconciler because you have love living it. That's what your nature, your nature should become that. And so there's, but what, there's, that word reconciliation has got so many um, connotations and changes and uh, interpretations. But if you were just to unpack it the way Jesus reconciled, we would discover there's three things to reconciliation. True reconciliation, that's why it's called it. True reconciliation is seen in the way Jesus reconciled us to the Father. The first thing that Jesus did, he died to the flesh. He had to die to start the process of reconciliation. We humans have to kill our pride to reconcile. It has to start somewhere. I have to let my pride go, my rights drop, my big butt stopped, and my cry for justice shut up. Everyone in a relationship, understand this, everyone in a relationship with anybody believes they are right and their cause is a just cause. You have an argument and you are being oh, saying the two opposite things and guess what? You equally believe I am justified. Is it true? And no, you know, some of you sound like you've never had an argument in your life. But you are, you believe you're right. The Pharisees attack Jesus and put him on the cross because they believe we are just and right. Every person believes it. So it has to go beyond that. We drop it for the sake of reconciliation. We can't move to this. Jesus wrestled with the flesh in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said, Father, take this burden of going to the cross and carrying the sin of the world from me. But nevertheless, not my will, your will. So he killed the flesh desires. Verse 15 of that scripture we read says, we no longer live for ourselves, but for him. Now, this is not, this is like, oh, this is not, the Holy Ghost comes upon you and everything becomes easy. This is, this is just the will of God being poured out in our lives and we make choices according to that. And that was the challenge for me, saying sorry for the things that happen to others by others, not me. It's a challenge when I feel right or been unfairly treated in any relationship. In my marriage, we are one. What hurts my wife hurts me. In my nation, we are one. What hurts my brother should hurt me. And my real reason for not wanting to say sorry was the injustice to me having to be perceived as guilty of something I didn't do. That was a, re a revelation. Think about that. I'm not going to say sorry because I didn't do it. And if I do, that makes me feel like I'm guilty. Well, guess what? 
Jesus didn't do anything wrong but went to the cross and was perceived as guilty so that you might have reconciliation with the Father. Powerful, isn't it? Who am I to say, what, what about, I didn't do it. Well, guess what? Jesus didn't do it. Ends there any discussion. You should hear some of the debates in my family over the subject. <laughs> If I back down, I may feel I'm guilty. If I back down in my argument with another, I'm wrong. So what if it heals and reconciles? Jesus was charged, sentenced as if he was guilty, but he wasn't. And guess what? Because of that, he has healed and reconciled us. See, if you want to reconcile, the first thing is you've got to die to the flesh. Second thing, there needs to be repentance and sorrow. Repentance recognises that there is a problem. To receive the love, work and grace of what Jesus did on the cross requires us to turn towards him. Walk away from where we were heading and follow him. That requires dying to the flesh. And we may claim to be a good person, but we are all born in sin. So we need to choose to follow him. That is what's required for any relationship to start reconciling. Choose to repent, whether spiritually or physically. Husband and wives, we need to be quick to repent and say sorry. Otherwise, the issues grow. See, when Mr. Rudd said sorry on behalf of the Australian people to the injustices towards the Aboriginal people, it was the second step. No person should be hunted, put in chains, treated as second class and even treated as not even being human. It goes against the heart of our Father who created all of us equal. And we should do whatever we can to reconcile that. No nation, family, or church should be torn apart because of differences. Can I tell you something? Stop using the word hate. Stop it. To anybody online, stop it. Because someone disagrees with us. It's not hate. It's just a difference of opinions. When I was a kid, if we used the word hate, we better have a good reason. Otherwise, there was a slap around the head. And it wasn't because my dad hated me. He didn't want me growing up think, do, saying and doing the wrong things. It's not, it's, it's a powerful word. It's, just a, it's a word that the devil loves. So I'm not going to say it unless it's against sin. Repentance positions us for healing and reconciliation. But there's still one more step. The next step is the step of forgiveness. Jesus and the Father forgave before we had repented. Our repentance accessed the forgiveness that was available to him. The first response to all of us as followers of Jesus is that first response is, I want, I'm going to forgive. Our natural response should be to forgive. We can protest and make a point, call for change and demand repentance, but the question is, will we forgive? In your relationship, will we forgive? If Christ hadn't forgiven, we would be a powerless, guilt-ridden people constantly saying, sorry, sorry, sorry. But we are free people cleansed and have an eternal home waiting for us because Jesus forgave. Otherwise, we would just be going around and repenting every single moment and never being free. If forgiveness is given and received, then there is no more sorrow and we won't need any more sorry days. The past becomes a distant memories. And if we don't forgive, we destroy ourselves and we stay victims to the past. I have a friend, a very close friend of us, ours, who, whose wife ran off with another man. One Sunday night, I got a call. Come around, please, please. And he didn't live very far apart. And he, the news was she'd packed up during the day and disappeared while he was at work. And I watched my friend break down, cry, be torn apart with grief, loss and betrayal. But he immersed himself in God's Word. You know, daily we started to see these verses coming to us. He would send us verses, not us to him, but he would send us verses where God was speaking and how God was encouraging, using the Word of God to heal the inner man. And he had thoughts of revenge and all of that. But he reached out. He chose to live according to the Word and he reached out and he forgave and asked his wife to come back. I'll do anything, come back and we'll seek counselling. I forgive you, I don't care what's happened. And he kept reaching and keep reaching and kept forgiving, kept forgiving, kept forgiving. She never came back, but he forgave her. Today, he has since remarried. He isn't a victim, but he is a loving husband, father and a grandfather, doing ministry, doing all kinds of things for God and for others. The power 
of forgiveness. Now, in this room, there's many that know that know stories like that. We can afford to. We cannot afford to not forgive. It's like taking poison, hoping the others will die. It will destroy us if we don't forgive. Matthew six says this: If you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will for not forgive your sins. I reckon that just ends every argument we have against being justified to not forgive. Because I want to be forgiven. I need to be forgiven. I desperately need to be forgiven. My life has been far from perfect, but He's forgiven. Church, we must forgive. It's part of overcoming and moving into the promise of Jesus. You know, I was having a conversation with my brother yesterday. He thinks he's going to proofread my sermons from now on. He's not even following Jesus as far as I know. But he said, you know what? I remember Phil. I remember Phil. If you're listening, Steve. I remember Phil. In the book of Revelations, it says that we must overcome. To those who overcome. I said, you're right. And the seven churches in the book of Revelations, it was said, if you, they're, they're, each of them had an issue or six of them had an issue. And he says, but if you overcome, to each of you overcome, there was a blessing available. What we're talking about is overcoming. The way through and over the issues that our world is embracing. That if we will do the Word of God and, and, and forgive and repent, die to the flesh, we shall overcome. And there is waiting eternal blessing. What I've learned that we may only need to repent once, but we may, not only once, but we may need to forgive time and time again because the devil loves to bring it back to memory. Keep forgiving, keep forgiving. I've noticed that he doesn't bring back repentance, but he brings out the issue to your memory. Forgiveness is the hardest step. We naturally want justice and payback or revenge. It's inside of us. It's so difficult, but absolutely necessary Jesus forgave and so can we I would like every head bowed every eye closed at this moment I want you to just to think about what God is speaking to you what is he speaking to you is he bringing up and this is this is what he wants in your life not what I want out of a sermon it's what is the Holy Spirit saying in this room right What's he saying corporately as a church? But more importantly, what's he saying to you personally? How's he speaking? What's he dealing with that is holding you back? That has become a blockage to you moving forward. That can, you know what, can even be a physical ailment in your body. Because that's what unforgiveness does. It can destroy and eat away at you. Is there a breakdown in your relationship? And so today, do something. Reconcile, repent of unforgiveness, die to the flesh. And before the day is out, reach out if you have to. And if that person is gone, no longer alive, then you can still forgive right now. Whatever the issue is, whatever you've been through, choose today. That I'm going to bury this. I'm going to make it a memory and not a reality. I'm, gonna make, I'm not allowing the past to become a reality in my present. Move beyond the injustice and heal today. Maybe, and so church, I'm calling out to you to just deal with that right now. I'm not going to ask for a response, but I'm asking you to deal with it right now. But maybe in this room, and we have a few guests here today, maybe you aren't a follower. Maybe those who will be listening online later, you aren't a follower of Jesus. You might have once followed Him, once, or you've never made that decision, or you're not even sure. The Bible says we can never truly love unless we've experienced God's love. And we, He first loved us. There's a tangible encounter with how much God loves us. See, sin separates us and leads us to eternal death. And we're all being born into that, which is why Jesus had to come to pay the price for sin, which is death, which is why He died, but then defeated the punishment of death by rising again and showing His ultimate power so that if we believe in Him that the consequences of our sin upon our lives is no longer there. 
we don't have to die. There we talked about it last week, that there is an eternity, a new heaven, a new Jerusalem. There's a new reign awaiting for us. But it starts when we make a choice in the now. So that's what born again means, to repent or to turn around and to be reborn of the Spirit, to connect with God. And so this morning, will you repent and follow Jesus? Will you receive this payment? Will you receive Jesus? And so I'm asking the whole church, the whole congregation here right now, to just pray with me, just after me, and I'm going to cover both areas in this prayer. So everybody pray with me as I pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I want to hear you. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you needing saving. As I forgive others today, forgive me. As I turn around and choose to follow you, forgive me. I receive your forgiveness, your mercy, your kindness and your love. Thank you, Jesus. I now follow you. Amen. If you made that decision today, you are so you're born again. In fact, keep your heads bowed and every eye closed. We have people looking from the back. And if you've made that decision, whether to again or to start afresh or for the first time, would you just lift your hand just so we can talk to you after the service? We won't be calling you to the front or anything like that, but we just want to know. We're going to give you a, 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 a something from us. And uh, just lift your hand in this room and we want to know who you are. Okay. Anybody right now? Father, across this auditorium right now, you have been speaking. You've been doing far more than man's words. And you are stirring up a new generation. It doesn't matter, it's not an age generation, it's a new generation of people that will be lovers and reconcilers of Jesus to this world, that will reveal as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. So I pray as we go this week that there will, the words out of our mouths will be pure and sweet and lovely. The meditations of our hearts will honour you. In Jesus' name I pray that, that he who overcomes will be blessed. Amen.